Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. I want to welcome our students here, our faculty and staff. I know we have other distinguished guests in the audience, including the president, for uh, what I am confident will be a fun and an informative discussion with, with Ken Griffin. Let me jump right into it. So Ken is the founder and CEO of Citadel, one of the world's largest alternative investment fir firms, which he launched in 1990, building on an interest in investing that began in his dorm room, sophomore year of college. He is also the non-executive chairman at Citadel Securities, which is now one of the world's leading market makers. It's an, an entity he and his partners established in 2002. Additionally, Ken is an active philanthropist and civic leader, having given more than $1.5 billion to expand access to high quality education at every level, advance medical research, and enhance our cities and communities. Ken, welcome. Thanks so much for coming. We're excited to have you with us today. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, I, I should say before we get started that this is, today is not the first day Ken and I have met. Um, Ken and I have met before. Our kids were in the same grade in pre-K and first grade. Um, when I knew Ken, or when I first met him, he was already uh, the principal of Citadel and the companies already referenced. But I'm curious about origins, Ken, before we get going. When we do these conversations, we like to spend a few moments talking about the early stages both because there's great information there and because at the very early stages of the Ken Griffin journey, you would have been closer in age and experience to the persons in the audience. Yeah? So I'm gonna begin with an origins question. So shortly after college, you started Citadel. And Citadel was recently named the most profitable hedge fund of all time. Um, <laughs> Actually, so, I need more applause. <laughs> That's a hard <laughs> <laughs> now, talk to me about the driving force of starting your career with the decision to build your own firm. There's risk taking there. There is a certain amount of self-confidence. There's uncertainty. Talk to us about that. I, I think he put as many questions into one question as you could possibly do. <laughs> so let's, let's break this down into a, into a couple of different conversations, if that's okay. The, the first is, and I, I tell this to everybody, you should be risk seeking at this point in your life. At this point in your life, you're in all likelihood, you'll have the least amount of responsibilities that you'll have at any point in your life. This is a great moment to think about pursuing opportunities that have the maximal personal interest, opportunity, opportunity to learn, opportunity to make a difference. Like you should go for it right here, right now because there will come a time where it's gonna be harder to take risk. Our parents get older, we have children, life changes. Right here, right now, you should absolutely be thinking about what are the high risk opportunities that you pursue that you will have the greatest experience with. Mm -hmm. And even if those opportunities don't work out, what you will learn from that journey, you will take on to everything else that you do in life. And with, with that as a vantage point, I started Citadel uh, effectively right out of college. I joined a, a firm in Chicago that gave me a capital to manage. We had a very simple understanding. If I did well, I'd raise money from outside investors. I'd start a formal firm. If things didn't go so well, I'd go back to graduate school. That was the deal. And I went to Chicago because the two partners that ran the firm that backed me, the partner in New York was like Central Casting Wall Street. And the partner in Chicago was like your high school physics teacher. Really plain spoken, brilliant, engaging, and I felt that he would care about my career. And I think it's really important as you step into the, into the journey out of, out of business school, where are you going to find people that are gonna take a vested interest in how you do? Because so much of your career will come down to mentorship and apprenticeship. Now, one might just conclude, well, wait a second, you know, Ken starts this firm by himself with one person as his mentor, how does that really work? One of the great parts of American culture is the willingness of people intergenerationally to give 
to those who are younger. So my mentors were the traders and salespeople on Wall Street, or the members that ran stock loan departments. I mean, you have no idea how many hours a day I spent on the phone, like a sponge, learning about finance from those with 15, 20, 25, 30 years of experience. You know, Terry O'Connor, Merrill Lynch, Boston, 617-350-5811. <laughs> and I could go to Merrill Lynch's offices, and you can't do that these days because of compliance rules, but I could go there at the end of my school day and stay till midnight. They didn't care, like use the Bloombergs, read the value lines, read the research. We are, we are going to help you learn more. And that's, that's a part of the American culture that you have to absolutely avail yourself while you're still young. Mm -hmm. Like take advantage of all the people in whatever firm you join and in whatever community you're part of to learn from those who simply have more years of experience. Mm -hmm. Like make the most of that. So now, how did I end up being an entrepreneur? And let's be clear, I ended up being successful. Mm -hmm. And those don't always go hand in hand. And I'm, I'm very appreciative of the fact that we've had a remarkable outcome. As, as a acquaintance of mine who started one of the most successful internet companies of all time put it, your great entrepreneurs have the right toolkit to solve a problem of that particular moment in time. So for me, that toolkit was an understanding of software engineering, an understanding of mathematics, a background in economics, a passion for finance, and a belief that you could use quantitative analytics to have a competitive advantage in the financial markets. And believe it or not, in the 1980s, that was still a reasonably novel thought. Hmm. In fact, uh, one of my earliest hires was a Russian rocket scientist, and one of my friends in Wall Street called me up and, and literally said, like, you're not trying to put man on the moon, you're trying to make money. And I'm like, no, no, I, I believe that this is the future, that those firms that can, that can price derivatives analytically are gonna have a real advantage. Now, he was a partner at one of the most successful investment banks that no longer exists, and we're at Citadel today as the, one of the largest market makers in the world. So I had the right toolkit at the right moment in time, and I think, I think my friend's really right. It's thinking about what tools that you have that at this moment unlock problems that just simply didn't exist before now. Everything we did back in the early 90s, you could take a few courses in quantitative finance here at Yale, you'd know everything we did. Hmm. It is completely commoditized. I mean, that's just a profound yeah. fact. And all the hard problems that we solved analytically on computers and thought about how to make this work are, are like on internet sites these days. Mm -hmm. I mean, the world has just leapt forward that fast that a huge competitive edge in 1990 is, is just, it's trivial today. That's how fast progress has been in finance. Now, the fortuitous part of the story is that over the last 30 years, we've radically improved our business and transformed what we do and how we do things. We continue to build our competitive advantages in the various businesses in which we choose to compete. And that's the essence of running a business. Mm -hmm. How do you build your competitive moat? So for us, we would trade, you know, think of it simply put, we trade financial assets. That involves a research process. We need to understand what moves the prices of assets more thoughtfully and more quickly than our competitors and then trading is simply how we monetize our research. The glory is in the research, trading is the monetization of the research. So there are some things in the answer you just gave there. There are two things you touch upon I would like to follow up on sure. very briefly if possible. One is this thing I'm gonna call, if not domain knowledge, then domain preparation. You were mathematically, you were numerate, you knew computers, you, you loved economics, that's kind of one thing. And then the second thing is the role of mentorship in your early life. So, as we talk to the students among us in particular, I'm wondering if you might say a few extra words about uh, identifying spaces where they can gain domain expertise. It might not be computers, it'll be some other thing. And how they might seek out mentorship, given the invaluable role you point to its having played in your career. So, that's, those are two great questions. Let's start with the domain expertise point. For all that you've learned at Yale, the vast majority of what will matter in your career, you have yet to learn. All right. 
Welcome to reality. <laughs> now, the great news is that Yale has taught you how to learn, and that is priceless. So your Yale degree worth its weight in gold because you've learned how to learn. And if I look at people who've been extraordinarily successful in finance, they are, they are lifetime learners. Mm -hmm. They're not saying 20 years ago I learned this or 10 years ago I learned this. They are lifetime learners. They're always learning. So for me, ironically today, my mentorship's actually my colleagues mm -hmm. from whom I'm always learning. And, and it's funny, you, you speak to me as being mathematically um, literate. You know, a, a conversation still that, I, that always makes me smile is one of my absolute top guys, we were going through a, a particular problem, and he looks at me and goes, with, with a room full of people, if you were good at math, this would be much easier to explain. <laughs> <laughs> but those are my mentors, are my colleagues that, that I work with, mm -hmm. that I choose to surround myself with. Now, early in my career, like I said, my, my mentors were spread across Wall Street. Mm -hmm. They took this intergenerational interest in developing me. But what I see in our four walls is, is my, my sharpest young colleagues gravitate towards those people who invest their time with them. Mm -hmm. So if I read, if I read a write-up that somebody is a really good individual contributor and they, in some sense, they sit by themselves and work, I'm reading a write-up of somebody who's going to fail. And it breaks my heart when I read these write-ups mm -hmm. because that's when management doesn't understand the role of management. That's when the, when the person doesn't understand how they're going to thrive. You need to find yourself in relationships where somebody takes an interest in you. Now, an interest in you won't, won't always, let's be clear, that doesn't necessarily mean it's like a, a big smiling festival. All right? Some of the best people you will work for you will find to be just incredibly painful to work for. <laughs> An interest in you doesn't necessarily mean like, wow, everything you do is great. Sometimes the best advice you get is, here are the four things you need to do better. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the great irony. I think if you went back through, the, through your life's journey and you thought about, for example, the teacher that just gave you the hardest time and just pushed you the hardest and it was the most difficult class, that teacher's probably one of your favorite teachers, even though there was probably not a moment in that year that you enjoyed going to class. But you appreciate all that you learned. So you want to find somebody who's going to push you. Some people push you in a more kind way than others, but you want to find somebody who's going to push you. And in every firm, it's, it's really important. If you aren't in that relationship out of the gate, You've got to figure out how to navigate that organization to work, work with a different team or work with somebody else or ultimately to change firms. Like, do not find yourself in an environment. If you're in an environment where I've been here for six months, I haven't learned very much, don't make it six months in a day. Mm. Either change teams, change firms, and get your life back in order. Mm -hmm. The most valuable equity that you'll create in your lifetime is your career equity. That's that's. That's, that you own. It doesn't go up and down with the market very much every day. You own that equity. And you want to think about how to maximize your career equity because that toolkit that you develop over your career, that's your ultimate job security. That's your ultimate ticket to success. Mm -hmm. I have a question uh, that touches upon the interaction between the kind of personal and the global, the micro and the macro. So there's a strand of research in economics that highlights the fact that career success, the, the sectors we choose, our, our success therein, is very much affected by the moment in which we enter the labor market. If I enter the labor market in a recession, a particular thing, kind of like that. Good. Our students will be graduating at their moment. And in this moment, we have uh, the emergence of a global banking crisis. We have near record inflation. We have concerns about a recession. We have a land war in Europe, that kind of thing. What macro considerations, besides the important micro advice you've just given, should these students take into account as they move on to their next step? What things do you want them to pay attention to? What about where the economy is headed would you like them to reflect on, et cetera? So I think that this student body is actually in an incredibly privileged position because the skills that you have will give you resiliency even in a downturn. 
you're not on the margin of the labor force. You're gonna be in a position where you'll be highly sought for for your skills. It may not be the pay you want at that moment in time if we're in an mm -hmm. economic downturn, but when you're in a firm in difficult moments, you actually see in well-managed firms, you see what real leadership teams are made of. It's much like when that rising tide lifts all boats, poorly run firms and great run firms, it's sometimes hard to distinguish the two. Mm -hmm. But when times are tough is when you really see the character of a firm, you see how they deal with adversity, you'll see them shift responsibility to more junior people in an effort, to, for example, to cut costs, mm -hmm. right? So what's, what's interesting is the number of people that I know that started their career 07, 08, 09, and 10 in finance, who have just such incredible perspective. About this was, sorry to interrupt. 07, 08, 09, everyone in the audience knows recession. You, okay, good. Continue. Yes. Continue. Great Continue. financial crisis, 08. Yeah. I mean, we had a banking crisis recently. That, that was like, in 08, that would be like not even a ripple you'd see right. on the sea. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. But the people that started then, 13, 14, 15 years later in their career, mm -hmm are remarkably wise okay. and well-grounded and, and able to, to navigate moments of adversity mm -hmm. as if it's a walk in the park. Because gotcha. they've been through a difficult time. Mm -hmm. it, we, in some sense, I, I say that at Citadel we forge talent. That implies a concept of pressure, mm -hmm. okay? The world also forges talent. And those difficult moments give people almost extraordinary opportunities to make decisions in the most difficult of times and to have a very fast rate of development and growth. Mm -hmm. right. So it's a very different answer in this room. If it was a room of people that had less in demand skills, it would be navigate towards safety. Mm -hmm. Find a safe port for now. Yeah. All right. But part of the reason that you came to Yale was to not have to do that. Got it. it was to be able to, on my own two feet, I can be at a big company, I can start a new venture, yeah. I'm confident in who I am and what I can do. Mm -hmm. don't, don't give up on that just because the economic backdrop's a little trickier today. Thanks so much, I like that answer. So I wanna pivot things very slightly uh, to talk about philanthropy for a brief moment. So, so you have given away, as I said at the beginning, uh, nearly one and a half billion dollars. Much of that philanthropy has gone to education. We recently read, in the, within the last day, of your very generous gift to Harvard, which was announced yesterday. Why is philanthropy in general, and the philanthropic efforts devoted to supporting education important, especially education at places like Harvard, Yale, Chicago? And a follow-up question to that is, are there things that you look at as the, uh, the curricula of these places? Are there skills that they should be teaching but are not? Are there particular kinds of instruction you wish to encourage, et cetera? Why give resources in your philanthropy to higher education? And what are you, what are you attempting to fix, to buttress, to support by so doing? So as, as you're well aware, I've, I've been active in, in giving to education from literally nursery school through higher education. And in some sense, I think this reflects just the, the reality that my family, if I look at my grandmother, she grew up with no running water. My grandfather didn't have much more. And they had a chance to live the American dream. And it was their high school education that gave them the toolkit to have a small business in the Midwest that turned into a mid-sized business over the course of, of their lifetime. And they did very well. By, by small town standards, extraordinarily well. Mm -hmm. And my parents always made it clear to me, and my dad was the first in his family to go to college, that your education is one part of who you are that nobody can ever take away. And I've seen people who are lifetime learners, and I see how far they can go with that gift. We, as a society, need to, if we're gonna be a democracy and a capitalist society, we need to have a population that is well-educated. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in, in K through 12, I, I do a, a lot of work today in supporting what I think are some of the best charter schools in the United States, places like Success Academy in New York City, which mm -hmm. 
has had a remarkable success in creating within New York City, within the inner city of New York City, the highest performing school system in the state of New York. Mm -hmm. I mean, Eva Moskowitz does God's work. She is unbelievable. And I just, I wish people would look at what she does there as a roadmap to educate our children across the country. Mm -hmm. And why do I say across the country? We, we both did live in, in Chicago, so I would know a fact like this. In Illinois, there's 53 schools last year that not one child was at grade level. Correct, yeah. And I don't know how we believe that those children are gonna be in a position to prosper in a modern economy with everything from generative AI on one side to genomics on the other side. Like, how, where are they gonna fit in that economy? when we're leaving them behind almost the point of illiteracy. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just, it, it's as if a third, it's as if a foreign nation was waging war against mm -hmm. us by destroying our schools. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unbelievable. Now, in higher education, I'm, I've been a strong supporter of America's greatest universities because that is where so much of the leadership of this country is created whether it's literally the leaders in D.C., it's the thought leaders in areas of, of economics, of, of public policy, in engineering. This is, this is my way mm -hmm. to support excellence in America. Mm -hmm. And we need, we need in America, we need to support that holistically more aggressively today because we really do face competition from China and from the rest of the world. And the United States has been through this wonderful period of post-World War II, where when it was all said and done, we really had no competitors. That has shifted in the last 15 years. Now, the Australians recently published a, a survey of, of roughly 45 of the most important emerging technologies, from quantum computing, to solar power cells, to various areas in, in biotechnology. The Chinese lead in 30-some of these areas. Yes, that's my expression when I read this paper too. And you know, the Australians are probably fairly fair referees, mm -hmm. all right? They don't particularly, you know, we, we know the, tr the drama between Australia and China. They're not looking to pay China a uh, gratuitous pat in the back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really frightening how the United States, which is so entrenched in this unshakable belief that we cannot be challenged in technology, mm -hmm is oblivious to the fact that not only are we being challenged, we're being beaten. Mm -hmm. So we need to redouble our efforts as a country in research and development, in supporting our, our, our top institutions of, of idea generation. And we have got to make sure that in our, in our finest universities, we're creating that next generation of leaders for our country. Mm -hmm. So if I support the best, I hope that I pull up in the competitive realm that defines America, yeah. other tier one institutions, and that pulls up the next group below, and it trickles down. I see, I see. I wanna pivot again, just a little bit. Sure. Um, so you're one of the country's best known citizens, most famous, most successful. Um, there's a sense when one meets such a person that they haven't had challenges because they get shunted to the side. Conversation surrounds places where you've had outsized success. It cannot be true, though, that your path, along your path, you didn't encounter challenge, difficulty, even failure, even failure. I want to know about that for a bit. I want to know about failures, your most significant challenge, what it was, how you overcame it, and what advice you would, might have for all of those in the room who will be beset with the challenge and failure as they proceed along their professional path. Well, there's a little saying, a little quip that I like to make. History is written by the winners. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Yes, it is. <laughs> so the wonderful history of Citadel is how we're the most profitable hedge fund of all time. Yeah. The chapter of how we were, we were on the verge of going out of business in 08 is not like a footnote in that book. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right, that's a, that's a very important note. 
it is not all been, it has not all been an easy march to success. It's it's had, you know, I, I think I have the uh, the interesting position in life. I've probably lost my team has probably lost more money than perhaps any other firm in existence. We just happen to have made more money <laughs> than almost any other firm in existence. Yeah, yeah. And it's the net yeah, yeah, yeah. that everyone talks about. I mean, there's years where our losses are, are hundreds of billions of dollars. Wow. Okay, I, I don't know if it's hundreds, it's over a hundred, maybe hundreds. It's, it's numbers that Big. are incomprehensible, okay. right? Yeah. So, number one is, all my losses are my tuition. I have the most expensive education in American history. <laughs> and a number of my colleagues have educations that are becoming competitively expensive. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right? And it, it, I think it's very important that, like, we, I, I in some sense, you have, to have to be held, you have to have a moment of levity, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if, if every time you lost money, you, you just got depressed and angry and you couldn't deal with it, you'd just have a very short career. So you need to be able to take a step back and go, it's a tuition bill I paid. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't mean that you don't think very long and hard about what went wrong, but you have to keep it in perspective. Mm -hmm. right? In 08, that tuition bill almost became getting expelled from school because we, were, we, we lost half of our equity in 16 weeks in a firm that had never had a double digit drawdown in 20 years. The only reason we survived, and there's a number of reasons, but the principal reason we survived is that when long-term capital failed in 1998, I went and met with a number of the senior people that worked at long-term capital. Why did I do this? What was my agenda? I wanted to understand how does a firm that loses 90% of its equity in a levered financial services industry still stay in business. Like if you ask me, that's one of the greatest accomplishments of all time, yeah. was that they lost 90% of their equity mm -hmm. before they lost control of their business in a financial services, in a, in a levered financial services mm -hmm. company. And, and much of what we learned from how they survived that was actually fundamentally, existentially important to our ability to withstand the turmoil of 2008. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a very important lesson here, which is not only do you want to learn from your mistakes, you really want to learn from for the other, other people's mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They're much yeah. cheaper tuition bills. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So you know, I've spent over my lifetime a lot of time at the proverbial scene of accidents where other firms have gone awry. Mm -hmm. When Enron filed for bankruptcy, do you guys even know what Enron is practically? Yeah. That's a, I'm dating myself here. <laughs> Enron was the largest energy trading firm in the United States, and they blew apart in a spectacular way in roughly 2001. The day they filed for bankruptcy, I chartered a Gulfstream jet, put 16 people on the Houston, and all we did was interview people at Enron hmm. for several days. What worked, what didn't work, how they made money, how they ran the business, what the competitive advantages were. Now, the great part about this story, I hired the entire leadership of the quantitative research effort at Enron. All the guys, all the people that knew how the place worked. Okay. UBS bought the business, except for the research team. Mm -hmm. We've made, I don't know, $30 billion in commodities since then, mm -hmm. and UBS shut the business down. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. That's about being on the ground. Yes. That's about understanding where the business actually created value. That's about extracting the right people from that moment in time mm -hmm. and surrounding them then over the years to come with the right leadership team, the right investment professionals, the right software engineers in building what is today one of the most important commodities businesses in the world. Mm. So going back to our OED experience, the first point is when you, are, when you are walking through hell, just put one foot in front of the other. Just mm. keep going. And literally, I was just praying that we would find our way out of that fire. Why don't I use this fire analogy? I, I called Lloyd Blankfein, who ran Goldman Sachs at the time, and I said, Lloyd, like, when is this going to end? And he goes, a forest fire ends when there's nothing left to burn. <laughs> I'm like, 
this isn't making me feel any better. <laughs> All right, yeah. but we never gave up during that period of time. And by we, it really was the entire leadership team. Mm -hmm. Number two, think about who around you is in a, is in a functional state of mind in a moment like that. Mm -hmm. Some people in a crisis like that cease to function. Other people shine. Mm -hmm. Make sure you're pushing decision making to those who are mentally in the game in the right way. Mm -hmm. Because some people just, it's their first adversity. It's like the proverbial deer in the headlights. Yeah. Right? And, and to be clear, there were days in 08 that I felt a bit like the deer in the headlights. And I was really fortunate to have partners around me for whom those were good days with good decisions. And we would change roles over the period of that 16 weeks. So this is where who you've surrounded yourself really matters. Because when you surround yourself with the right team, you will buttress each other on your darkest days in a really important way. Can I ask you something about perseverance or, or grit, if, if I may use that expression? Things are bad, the forest fire is going on, I gotta get through, you said, put one foot in front of the other. Is, is perseverance something with which we are inherently endowed? Is it something that can be acquired or learned? If it is the latter, what advice would you have about its development? So I believe it's, it's both, okay. all right? There's, there's no doubt that across individuals, there's a various capacity to deal with stress. Mm -hmm. like, like some people just struggle with stress, other people just prosper when they're under stress. And, and there's various, there are different kinds of stressors. Mm -hmm. All right, like my biggest stressor, well that's me. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm always trying to figure out how I can do better, be better. I, 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 I might be demanding the people that work for me, I'm no less demanding of myself. Mm -hmm. But you need to know what your stressors are and then how that fits into your choice of career and your choice of how you interact with others. Uh, for most people, the stress that's hardest is stress that relates to events that are outside of their control. For other people, the most difficult stress, the stress they impose on themselves. So you need to understand what your stressors are and how you deal with that stress. And then if you, if you look at um, resilience, and I think resilience goes hand in hand with grit and perseverance, mm -hmm. I think this goes back to that story about those who started their careers in 08. Yeah in 07, mm -hmm. when you go through a difficult period of time mm -hmm. and you see you're actually able to do that, it strengthens you for the next time. Got it. All right, one of my absolute top guys, he's, he's really good. When he was first in a management role and somebody who worked from him would quit, it, he would be just devastated. He, on the phone, like, I can't believe this, and am I up for this job, and can I do this? I'm like, Get a grip, like you got this. Yeah. Like somebody quit, it's okay. And now, you know, 10 years later, somebody quits, he's like, well, they left. Just, mm -hmm. he doesn't bother him anymore. I mean, it bothers him, but not in a way that makes him dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. And you, you see that, it just, it just, people grow over time, all right? Now, here's what's really great about that story, is when he's not so anxious about what people are going to do who work for him, i.e. they might leave, guess what? He's a much better manager. When you're confident that you're gonna be able to move on with somebody not on your team, then you can actually really coach someone and really give somebody direct feedback and give somebody responsibility and give them the space to succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, ironically, in being a really good manager, a really good manager is not anxious about whether or not a given person on their team is going to leave. I have to, I have to, I have to work on this. I have to work on this. Right. Yeah, 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 I have to work on this. This doesn't mean they don't care about yeah. the person, but it means they've elevated themselves to a point where they can be in the right relationship to bring the best out of the person. Okay. All right. So I read something about you. I, I read lots of things about you. So there's a Financial Times article that says, that Citadel Commodities hired a meteorology firm to predict thunderstorms and cyclones, which seems to me a hugely unusual use of technology for a trading firm. 
Why would you do such a thing? Well, the press these days takes great liberty with what they write. <laughs> And that's a much better story <laughs> yeah, okay. than, the, than, than the real story. Yeah. Now, the real story is we, we acquired a competitor of ours named Cumulus. Mm -hmm. And the people that ran Cumulus made a huge commitment to understanding how to do weather forecasting. Mm -hmm. And ran one of, the, one of the world's top meteorology efforts outside of the European Union's own uh, multi-government effort, which is, which is literally probably the best in the world. It's not, it's not the US. Yeah. So the Europeans have a speed weather forecasting. We, in trading commodities, for example, power, care deeply about cloud cover, wind, temperature. And we care about it very deeply in a small number of geographies, okay. right? Like, it doesn't matter what the temperature is in the middle of Wyoming, mm -hmm. there's no energy demand. But we really care about wind and cloud cover in Germany where renewables are such an important part of the landscape. And so we've made a huge investment over the years in improving our ability to forecast the weather in environments like that. Mm -hmm. And of equal importance, what you would learn here at Yale, is having a reasonable distribution of weather forecasts so we can understand the distribution of outcomes that we're gonna have. Mm -hmm. You know, when, 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 when you find yourself in the risk-taking seat, it will not be this is a black and white good decision. It will be this is a decision and here's my upside and here's my downside. And you actually wanna always be thinking in distributional terms, whether you're buying a stock mm -hmm. or building a plant, right? I'm gonna build a, a manufacturing plant to make some product X, Y, Z, which is gonna cost us $3 billion to build this plant. Mm -hmm. And well, what are the odds that by the time we get to market, the product that we create is already outdated? You want to think about that. Mm -hmm. You want to think about the distribution of outcomes. And, and good leadership is about making decisions. It's, first of all, it's about making informed decisions. So you, you think about the different possibilities that may play out. And then it's, about, then it's about acknowledging, I'm going to make a decision under uncertainty. And, it's, and people who are very good at business, generally speaking, are very good at understanding the process is what matters. It matters a lot. Do I, do I make decisions with a well-framed and thought-out process? Mm -hmm. and, and appreciate that some of the outcomes will appear to be exogenous, but they were just in my range of distributions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? People get in trouble when they, when they start to become reductionist. Like, if I do X, Y is gonna happen. Very little in business is actually that straightforward. I mean, just think about this simple fact. How many retailers had a mobile strategy in 2004 before the iPhone? Hmm. No one. Right. And if you don't have a, a strategy to engage with consumers on mobile today yeah. in retail, you're probably not in business. So the world around you is going to be constantly changing. And by leaving yourself in a position to be more psychologically flexible, mm -hmm and to be clear, financially flexible, to deal with evolving change, you have a much higher chance of being a survivor. Yeah. Now, you were a very early adopter in technology and finance. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning of our talk, as you look forward, what role do you see technology in finance playing as we move forward? I have in mind here AI, I have chat, uh, what's the thing? Chat GPT. Chat GPT, I have uh, you, that. Mm -hmm. Is this going to be a big deal? What would your thoughts be about that for me and for our students and guests? So, so chat GPT, I think, is, is it's both incredibly powerful and, in many respects, incredibly terrifying. Because it will, it will take a number of white-collar jobs and put them at risk. You know, for example, it's pretty clear that within a very short period of time, ChatGPT will write better contracts than most first or second year lawyers. Mm. That's an unprecedented thought that we are on that precipice. You know, somebody asked, well, you know, what are the things that you think about for ChatGPT? Here's one that, that is self-evident to my software engineers. What a great way to port code from a defunct language to a modern language. Mm. You know, in the history of software engineering, languages have come and gone. Yeah. Languages I learned back in the 80s, I, I name them today, fourth. Anyone here program a computer? Anyone use fourth? There's not one hand going up. <laughs> yeah. These are dead languages. Yeah. COBOL's of the same ilk. Mm -hmm. COBOL's used to run a big chunk of the American banking system. 
technology like ChatGPT will port all this code to modern languages. Mm -hmm. Like that's just unbelievable the amount of legacy debt we can clean up. It'll write contracts. It's gonna it's gonna transform a lot of work that we do in the economy. And yet the dark side of it is it will eliminate a lot of jobs in the short run, and people who have not been in a lifetime pursuit of continuous learning are gonna find themselves in a very dark place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I keep going back to this point. In my 50s, and even my 40s, I would have friends or contemporaries who you saw got off the learning treadmill, and life just passes them by. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't pass them by in 20 years, it passes them by in five or 10. And that goes back to my very first point. Yes, I don't yes. want to keep hitting it, you know, beating a dead horse. No, 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 it's a good point, I, yeah. But it's really important. If you're not finding yourself learning and growing as a leader, as a domain expert in your field that you pursue first, you've got to move on. Mm. The other thing to say is that if, if the field that you choose to pursue ultimately ha inspires no passion, you need to move on also. Okay. Because if you're not passionate about the field you're engaged in, you won't have the grit or perseverance to compete with those who are. Mm -hmm. right? a, a woman who worked for us back in the 90s, super gifted, uh, one of my senior colleagues came to me and says, you need to sit down with her. She wants to go to medical school and you've got to convince her to stay. Yeah. And I said, I'm happy to sit down with her and the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna offer to write her a letter of recommendation. The world desperately needs more good doctors. Mm -hmm. And if that's what she wants to be, we're gonna help her be that. Mm -hmm. Like when somebody leaves Citadel to go do something in a, a field afar, I am so happy for them. You know, one of my colleagues went to work on, on very precise microdosing of insulin to help people with diabetes. And based upon some of the principles that we use to predict equity prices, mm -hmm. like what a fascinating transformational use of a technology that we developed in our trading. If somebody leaves to go to a competitor. Ah, different thing. Well, that, <laughs> that invokes all kinds of emotions. But yeah. principally, okay, mm -hmm. what, what did we get wrong here? Mm -hmm. Do we not create the opportunity? Do we not promote the person aggressively enough? Yeah. Or does the person have a sense of self that's not, not representative of reality? Mm -hmm. You know, Wall Street's a field of large egos and sometimes people who aren't ready to take on big roles from our perspective, find somebody else who disagrees with our perspective and they hire them to do a big job. And sometimes you say, God bless and good luck. Mm -hmm. All right, so you're always thinking every time something goes right, yeah. what'd you get right? Mm -hmm. Something goes wrong, what'd you get wrong? Keep extracting the lessons. Okay, good. So I wanna make sure I leave time for questions. Sure. For, from, from our audience, but I, I have one for you about, um, I'm gonna call it work-life balance. This has come up a lot in my conversations with students, with visitors to the school. How do you juggle the, very, the myriad responsibilities you confront as a, a leader of a hedge fund, a market maker, all the rest, with the rest of life, the rest of life? How do you find balance? What advice would you offer here? Should balance be something that is pushed off until they've achieved success. Well, I'm curious. I really would want the Ken Griffin view of that. Well, well uh, so success is elusive. Like however high you climb, success is probably twice as far. That was told to me by one of my friends who's one of the most successful people in the history of finance. Mm -hmm. Like, what is success? He's like, it's twice what I've accomplished. <laughs> That's a pretty daunting concept, yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, there's a part of that though, which leaves open that, okay, well, what I need to learn to do that, yeah, yeah. right? So that goes back to this, this lifetime interest learning. Okay, so let's talk about work-life balance. I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss on this topic to give the best possible answer because there's clearly a trend towards individuals in their 20s and 30s at the office, in the work environment, a lot less. Mm -hmm. I worry collectively, what does this mean for American competitiveness and for the success of American businesses? Because there's no doubt that in your 20s and 30s, your rate of learning 
is just, again, I keep saying the same word, astronomically high. And not having the experiences that go with being on the field of, of engagement, I think greatly diminishes the arc of one's career possibilities. Mm -hmm. I, I worry about this deeply, that we have, we have turned, in some sense, I feel like my generation was deferred gratification, mm -hmm. and now there's a much stronger focus culturally on gratification here and now. It's not clear to me how this is going to play out because what I, what I see is that people that have really intense careers early on just tend to go so much further over the ensuing 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. Like this idea of late bloomers in careers, it happens, but I think it's infrequent. I think it's important to hit the ground running and to run pretty hard early on. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to my commentary, if the work isn't really satisfying, go find somewhere else to run. Because if you're not running and it's not satisfying, where, where do you think you're gonna be in 20 years? Like, where are you going to be? Mm -hmm. You're gonna be miserable and unhappy is where you're gonna be. But if your work's actually really engaging and exciting, you're gonna look back on, on the first 10 years in that journey and go like, you know what, I worked really hard we did some really amazing things. And I'm really proud of that. Mm -hmm. And you know, with the success and the, and the sense of earned success, which is very important, there will come the space to give yourself room to enjoy other interests, your children, your family, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. I, I really think we're making a mistake by not emphasizing to um, the future leaders of our country, like go for it early have all the experiences that go with that and enjoy the earned success that goes with that. And that's a, that's a, and that does, to be clear, that opens, there's an open message there that, that as you go through the journey of life, you will create time and space by having done so. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, I don't know where you are in your 40s and 50s in the same way. Are you still in some sense in the grind of yeah. trying to pay your mortgage, pay for your kids to go to an Ivy League school yeah. and, some very high price, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Like, have you not gotten to escape velocity? Mm -hmm. I have so many questions about this. this is great, but I want to make sure I leave time for others. Sure. You've been very generous here and open, Ken. I really appreciate it. I so hope just, be just on, I will say this. It's, it, everyone knows, sit out, we're five days a week in the office. Like, that's who we are. We've been that way since summer of 2021. Mm -hmm. I think it's not a coincidence that corresponds with our most profitable years ever. Interesting. All right. Mm -hmm. Everybody who applies on camp from off campuses knows that's how we are. Mm -hmm. We have a hundred thousand applicants for positions this year. Wow. We've never had so many people looking to work at our firm. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives me great hope about the future of our country because yeah. that's a hundred thousand young men and women who want careers. Mm -hmm. Like we have a simple proposition. We offer careers. I'm not interested in offering jobs. I'm interested in creating careers. And it's, it's I feel like just a giant sigh of relief. That's still with us post pandemic. People want careers. That's, that's tremendous. So we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. I have a bunch more I'm not gonna ask anymore. I'll open it up to the audience. I think there are microphones going around. Uh, here is, so as someone keep an order where I'm pointing, that's one. That's two, okay? That's three, okay. Yeah. Hi, Ken. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. In class, we've learned about the importance of balancing the present and the future. Peter Drucker has been known to say, the CEO decides on the balance between yield from the present activities and investment in an unknown, unknowable, and highly uncertain future. It's a judgment rather than a decision based on facts. At what point do you feel you were able to develop that ability to comfortably make those judgments? Was it just time or was there something in particular that helped you get there? Quantity of decisions made. And, and to be clear, the more decisions of a similar nature you can make, the better at those decisions you become. 
So when we think about business activities far away from our core, I get much more anxious, like much more anxious. Mm -hmm. And decisions within our core, I think we make pretty easily and pretty fluidly. So it's, proc it's, it's repeat, it's repetition of the type of decision you then you start to learn what should I ask, what do I need to know, so on and so forth. It's repetition. It's, it's like being an athlete. Reps matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Two. That was number two, I think, is over here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I have a question about the emerging technologies. So uh, I believe before AI, we have the previous big topic was crypto, right? And uh, crypto was created for the purpose of decentralization of value. But uh, in recent years, we see the applications of crypto seems to be deviating from the original purpose. If you look at like FTX and like NFTs, and something seems to have gone wrong in that case. So I believe as an investor, can you have the uh, ability to influence how these technologies uh, develop uh, and being applicated uh, to in our world to some extent. So uh, what do you think is the reason for uh, something that went wrong with crypto? And do you think the same would happen to the next big technology such as AI? And how do we prevent that from happening? So that's a great question. So let's be clear. Every emergent technology has a moment of, of like hype. That's just the nature of the beast. It's new. It's flashy. We, we get mm -hmm. excited about it. And blockchain, which underlies cryptocurrencies, was a really interesting uh, engineering feat. How do you create the ability to have a decentralized trusted network? The problem is it's been a bit of a solution in search of a problem. Like Visa, MasterCard, cash works pretty well. And Bitcoin, ironically, very high transaction costs. It's not cheap to use Bitcoin to pay for anything. And then who deals with fraud prevention, other issues that go in day-to-day -day life? Mm -hmm. so, so I think there's a, I think Bitcoin's an interesting case study. Blockchain, really cool technology. People wanted to find a solution or a, a problem to solve with that technology, and we just haven't found that problem yet. It just doesn't exist. The other great irony is that crypto has demonstrated that people actually care about having regulated financial institutions. Mm -hmm. right? FTX mm -hmm. is a bit of a case study of um, maybe I do want to make sure my bank is supervised. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do want to have that. Yeah. So AI, a lot of hyperbole right now. There will be some really interesting wins that come out of the current generation of AI. And to be clear, the current generation of AI is an extension of machine learning, which really hit the world with TensorFlow back, must be now almost nine years ago, give or take. Mm -hmm. And TensorFlow, which Google developed, that's the machine learning model that Google built, let me be clear, has, has had huge impacts on our economy already. Often subtle, often under the cover. Mm -hmm. When you call Amazon, there's an ML model that routes your call to the right person to deal with you based upon what you ordered, when you ordered it, and the probability that that is the reason you're calling them. Yeah. Right. So just think about the efficiency in their call center that for choice, you end up with somebody who actually goes, you bought that Samsung TV? I know how to make sure it works. Let me walk you through it. It's like incredible. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these technologies, like machine learning, already proven in the field, make a positive impact. Chat GPT, in some sense, the next generation of it. But when you can interact with Chat GPT and, and it writes a story, and you're going like, that's pretty good. That's pretty profound. We're just not used to seeing that as people. It's a lot different than the zeros and ones that come out of a TensorFlow model. So the third, a third question was over here. I don't think I miss anyone. Oh, sorry. Yes. Time. Uh, uh, my question would be uh, about your decision uh, on your or your, your business. How do you think? Um, how do you think? And how do you make a decision about the? Uh, uh, about start starting a new business uh, when you're starting a new business. Uh, for, uh, please exemplify some of them and could you, how, how did you think about these uh, decisions? For, for example, uh, unlike other hedge funds, uh, Citadel started um, many you know, other businesses like, like uh, securities companies and um, they adopt a new strategies uh, every, uh, all the time. For, 
for, uh, from um, arbitrage tra trading to like a commodity trading. So how, so how do we decide you... which new businesses to pursue? Oh, yeah. um, so let's, let's go back to 100,000 feet. And one of, my, one of my really closest friends is a very, very thoughtful venture capitalist. Total addressable market matters. Why does it matter? Because the odds that you get everything right to launch a successful product, those odds, those odds aren't very high. So when it all comes together, you want there to be something at the end of the rainbow. All right? So if I think about firms I want to go work for, I think about ventures I want to start, and this I is you, to be clear, <laughs> think about the total addressable market of the product or business that you're going to pursue. So markets that we're in, deep, liquid markets. That means that when we do our research right, we can monetize it because we can get the liquidity to express that view. If we were the world's best trader of pick an esoteric product, uh, coal these days is pretty illiquid. What are you gonna do with that? Like you just can't buy or sell that much coal. Mm -hmm. Besides the fact that it has a whole bunch of issues with our investor base these days, you just can't make much money doing that. So we want to be in deep, liquid markets. Now, startups will often start in niches, try to work their way into the bigger market. Be careful with that because, again, it's hard to attract people to work in a business that's going to go after a niche. Right? An entrepreneur not only has to find a market that's big enough to be worthy of venture capitals and others to throw resources at, but it's big enough to attract people will share a vision of, I want to go do that. I want to be a part of that journey, right? You've got to, you're always selling. Mm -hmm. when, my, when the guy that backed me out of college retired from Chicago, he said I could have whatever I wanted from his office. I took the plaque that probably cost $9.99, mm -hmm. as in $9.99. And that plaque said, if we're all going to eat, someone's got to sell. And that's the story of being an entrepreneur or being a CEO. If we're all going to eat, someone's got to sell. And every CEO, I'll tell you what, they're a salesperson. They got to, they got to sell a venture capital firm. They got to sell a customer. They have to sell an employee. Mm -hmm. They got to make sure that with the government that they sell like what we do, we do right. We dot the I's, we cross the T's, we follow the regulations. You are always selling. And if you don't like to sell, here's my advice. Get over it. <laughs> All right? I had no interest in selling when I was 20 years old. Having crisscrossed the world dozens of times, having, I, I was in a conference room in 1994 in Switzerland trying to raise money. Like, let me tell you about a bad trip. I show up for lunch, and uh, the guy I meet with, he goes, You're not John Griffin. I said, No, I'm Ken Griffin. He goes, I, 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 I thought you were John Griffin from Fenchurch. I, I need to go. <laughs> Great. I just flew all the way to Switzerland to have my lunch walk out of me. Yeah. Then I get to go to another meeting later that day. And we were doing convertible bond arbitrage. And in 94, that was a tough space to be in. And I'm in this beautiful office in Switzerland. This guy smoking this cigar and this beautiful sofa and this beautiful office. <sighs> so sad. Such a bright young man. So picked the wrong career. <laughs> oh, what a great day I'm having in Zurich. <laughs> I guess it was actually Geneva. But my point is, like, you're just, I, you just got to play through these moments. Yeah. All right? So large markets, big, big addressable space. And in successful businesses, let's be clear, they solved the needs of a consumer. Like, that's what Steve Jobs got so right was I'm going to think about how to deliver technology in a package that solves the consumer's need. The, the, I, the original iPod mini, that was an MP3 player. It had been made by, by a number of firms around the world. But Steve Jobs made it easy to use, made it a, a nice form factor, packaged it in a beautiful box. The rest is history. 
the, I, the iPhone. I mean, let's be clear. BlackBerry had a killer product, but the iPhone was mm -hmm. easier. The app capability allowed it to have others contribute to its universe. Others contribute to the universe, create network effects. Network effects are golden. Like you want a great business? Find a powerful network effect. Mm -hmm. Where the more people that use your product over time, the better your product becomes, that becomes a flywheel of competitive advantage. All right, some of these concepts, good to great, Jim Collins, always fun to read. Uh, Bruce Henderson on strategy, BCG, dated in roughly the 1960s, really fun to read. Another book, out of print, Hardball, really fun to read. Hardball is, is just great. It's, it's in business, don't play to win, beat to win by a landslide. Like if you're just playing to win, you're just you're not getting the job done. Like you got to win by a landslide. If you don't win by a landslide, then your competitors are come back and they're going to beat you. All right, Michael Dell, Dell Computer. He manufactured computers in America and won. Think about how well they ran that business to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that takes a step back, which is you know you've done this at Yale and you're going to do this the rest of your life. You want to study successful businesses, even if they're far afield from what you do. You know, if I'm in a manufacturing plant, I'm looking at, you know, there are manufacturing plants, in particular in Europe, their use of technology, of process management, operations management, it's just breathtaking. All right. Our risk wall, you'll love this. We built a risk wall in Chicago. Before we built this risk wall, it was written that we had like B quality risk management. On this giant screen, 25, 30 feet long, 10 feet high, we rendered all the same risk management information we used to put on a hard copy. We went from being B to the industry leader, just like that. Packaging matters. Where did the idea for the risk wall come from? Being at Saudi Aramco's operations facility in Saudi Arabia, where they oversee their production from their oil fields, the output from their power plants, the ships on the open sea. And looking at that visualization and seeing how powerful that was and going, you know what, if I render our risk numbers the same way, people's jaws are going to drop. And they do. So th you, know, you need to always think as, a, as an entrepreneur, like how do you create advantages? And how do you learn from not just your competitors, but businesses afar far afield from you, where a lot of really interesting, fun things happen that you can learn from and incorporate? Ken, thank you so much. Listen. We are over time. All right. But, but, one short question. You will be short, you promise. I yeah? promise. And I you promise. will be brisk in the answer. Yeah. One more question. Yeah. So, Mr. Griffin, thank you for being here. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of another Chicago resident, Milton Friedman, but the profits and how they are made in high frequency trading, I don't know what to think of it. Um, I get that it's legal, but is it moral? So, it's absolutely moral because the trading activity that we do in the market increases liquidity. And by increasing liquidity, you bring down the cost of capital for corporate America. I'll give you a very simple thing to think about. Mutual fund managers, institutional money managers, when they think about how big of a position to own in a company, they think about days of traded volume. I'll own three days of traded volume. I'll own five days of traded volume. So use as a proxy, a shorthand, for how difficult it is to get into or out of a position. And everybody thinks about liquidity and values liquidity. Mm -hmm. So the, quote, high frequency traders, and let's be clear, those are modern day market makers. We compete aggressively with each other about where we believe price should be. Mm -hmm. That creates trading volume. That creates liquidity for real money players, your capital research, your fidelity, your T row prices to rebalance their portfolio. And this really matters when companies go to raise capital. Because if a stock is liquid, it's very easy to get a spot secondary done to raise money. A stock that's illiquid, good luck. You're not getting that deal done. So if you ask me if it's moral, not only is it moral, it's actually incredibly positive for society that we have one of the deepest, most liquid capital markets in the world. Let's tie that all the way back to the people in this room. 
when you've got a successful startup, an idea, like I'm gonna go make this happen, you're gonna have to convince a venture capitalist to give you that check. If they believe they can go public with your idea, you're gonna get that check. But if our public markets aren't liquid, if capital cannot be raised, you won't get the check from the VC firm to run your business. It's not gonna happen. It's one very large flywheel, a virtuous circle, that makes capitalism work in America. It works in the equity market, it works in the debt market. Let's give you the counterfactual. Look at Europe. Phenomenally good schools, well-educated population. Their capital market's much smaller than ours as a percent of, of total economic activity. The corporate debt market in Europe, in the United States, 80% of all corporate debt's provided by capital markets. In Europe, it's 20% capital markets, 80% banks. High yield finance, Drexel, so on and so forth. The origin story of that, all right? Name 10 startups of note in Europe over the last 25 years. Like you can name a few, but it's hard. In the United States, I could just sit up here and just name one after another. Our capital markets are an incredibly important part of what makes our economy work. And that ability to have liquidity, which is created by today's modern market makers, is an important integral part of this entire system that makes the United States the, the leader in the world in new corporate formation, innovation, and the great success stories from Google to Apple that at best are often copied around the world, but they were ideas born here. Great question. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it.